Turn your Bibles now to Acts 1. We are concluding today our missions pickup month, and I think it is fitting and appropriate for us to take a look at once again the great commission of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the builder of his church. Very briefly, the Great Commission is the making of disciples. The Great Commission is the making of disciples of Jesus Christ out of all ethnicities of the world. This is our mission. This is the reason why Jesus left his church. And yes, the song is right. Each one can reach one because the people need the Lord. This is our mission. And I think it is wise for us today to be reminded of one of the great and primary purposes for our local church. Other than the purpose to edify, that is to build up, our brothers and sisters in Christ and to encourage one another and to help one another uh, carry their burdens one with another and to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, the reason why Jesus left his church is this mission that we have, the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and in turn, seeing the reproduction of more disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that you get my point this morning. I wanted to remind you of the Great Commission. This is what we're here for, local church. But I want to look at the Great Commission today in light of the amazing event which proceeded immediately after the Lord gave his last command, which is our first priority, and that is the Great Commission. I want to look at that amazing event, which proceeded immediately right after the Lord Jesus Christ gave his last command. And that was the event of Jesus Christ's ascension into heaven. Did you know that in the history of the church, there used to be a great celebration of the ascension? If you did not know this, church, the ascension of Jesus Christ took place 40 days after his resurrection. Easter this year came on April the 17th. And if you counted 40 days from April 17th, it would land on May 26th. This last Thursday would have been the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But did you hear anyone celebrate it? No, most probably not. It is one of the most important events in the life and ministry of Jesus, yet it is now also one of the most ignored doctrines or events in the life and ministry of our Lord. Now, to be fair, the Catholics the Methodists and others moved the Ascension Day from what they call a Good Thursday to Sunday. And if you're counting, this Sunday would have been the celebration of the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ Ascension Day. But as a Baptist myself, I've never once thought, much less celebrated, the ascension until today when I at least am bringing it to your attention. 
But we're not here to vote on whether we should celebrate it or not. But my point today is to conclude our missions pickup and what a fitting day it is to do because Jesus gave the Great Commission immediately before he ascended into heaven. Okay, let's look at Acts. The book of Acts was written by Luke. Luke, the physician and close companion of the Apostle Paul, he wrote this treatise, this entire book, to a man by the name of Theophilus, possibly a very high-ranking Greek official in the Roman Empire, to whom also was written the book of Luke, Luke's first volume, The Gospel of Jesus Christ According to Luke. Follow along as I read out loud verses 1 through 11. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in the manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Thus far, the reading of God's authoritative word. Receive it as such. It is infallible. It is inspired. It is sufficient for our needs today. I want us to come away today with this amazing reminder. I want you to get this point. I have one major point to make this morning. And children, I want you to pay very good attention because I'm going to be talking about dragon and the prince who will slay that dragon in the grand scheme of things. But all of us should come out, should come away with this major point with this encouragement with this exhortation this morning and it is this that the amazing ascension of Jesus reminds us get this that everything within the grand scheme of God is happening according to plan Everything is going according to plan. The teaching of the scripture seems to point to this great amazing truth. There is a grand purpose. There is an, an overarching plan. 
There is a grand scheme of things that this whole world is being ushered into. This whole world is being directed towards. This whole world is being steered to a great end. And if you think of it in terms of a great novel, there is a beginning, a middle, and then an end. And the amazing event of the ascension of Jesus reminds us that everything is going according to plan. I'm going to pick up in the middle of the story, and then I will ask you what the ending of this grand story is, but then I will help you answer that question by going back to the beginning of the story. Are you following me? Say amen. All right, so Acts 1, 1 through 11 finds us right in the middle of this grand novel, this grand narrative, this grand scheme of God's. I want to remind you that the prevailing expectation of the Jews, we read Acts 1, 1 through 11, the prevailing expectation of the Jews was that God was going to send them a political slash militaristic Messiah who would then wipe out the oppressors of the chosen nation of Israel. That was their expectation. They expected that the Messiah would conquer all their enemies and then would reestablish the golden age of which they heard a lot about and for which they desired a lot. This is why you read in this passage the nagging question, seems to be out of place question. And what was that question? Lord, will you now restore the kingdom of God? That's why, because of their prevailing expectation that God would have sent them a militaristic Messiah who would wipe out their oppressors. They wanted Jesus now to restore the kingdom to Israel. That is the kingdom of God. That is the government of God centered in Jerusalem. That is a kingdom at the very least similar to the golden age during King David's and David's son's reigns in Israel. To which, how did Jesus answer? Jesus did not give them what they expected to hear. And the apostles were Jews themselves and therefore had the same expectation of that Messiah. We see hints of that in the Gospels. For, for, for example, Matthew, Matthew 20. Go there, please. You will remember Salome, the mother of James and John, who asked that the king, King Jesus, would grant the highest positions for her sons. Remember that? And just prior to this episode, by the way, just prior to this episode, you're turning there, Matthew 20, verses 17 through 21. Jesus had just told his 12 disciples the immediate plans of Jesus. And it was as though Jesus' plain lying out of his immediate plans just went in one ear and out the other in an instant. Nobody caught it at all. Nobody caught the plans, the grand plans of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? And how come? Because their expectation of the Messiah was the one who was the conquering king, not a dying servant, not a suffering Messiah. Look at with me, verses 17 through 21 of Matthew 20. 
And Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the 12 disciples apart in the way and said to them, this is his great plan. And that great plan just went in one ear and out the other. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. Did that register in the apostles' ears, in the apostles' hearts? I don't think so. Verse number 19. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. Verse 20, then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. Wow. Did she miss it? Did he? Did they miss it? Another instance, look at Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 22. Just a few pages there from where you're at. Jesus, again, had plainly laid out for his disciples the plan and purposes of Jesus is coming down from heaven. He was going to be delivered up to the religious elites, he was going to be killed, and he was going to be raised up again from the dead. But Peter, immersed in the expectation that the Messiah would conquer all their enemies and then reestablish the golden age of King David, grabbed Jesus by the shoulders. Remember this story? And shook him and said to him, look at verses 22 and 23 of Matthew 16, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine rebuking the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Saying to him, be it far from thee, Lord. Lord, I don't want you to die. Lord, I don't want you to be delivered up to the religious elites. What a horrendous plan that is, God. <laughs> And then Peter said, This shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God. You're not understanding the grand scheme of God. But those that be of men, you try to stick to your manly ideas, manly plan. Their expectations were wrong. Many times, listen now, our expectations are wrong too, aren't they? And we need to be immersed in the grand scheme of the Lord. We need to be immersed in His plans. We need to be immersed. We need to know and understand His purposes. We need to be humble enough. Here's the practical application about this today. We need to be humble enough to be corrected by His Word so that we're not too discouraged with the frustrations of the time. When disappointments came to the apostles, they were devastated. In fact, all of them, except for John the Beloved, abandoned Jesus there on the cruel crucifixion, the Roman execution of a criminal. They all abandoned him. Okay. Pastor Christian, what is this grand ending of the grand scheme of God that you're talking about? I want you to turn to Psalm 110. And as you're turning there, I want to tell you that this verse is perhaps the most succinct, the most precise, the most concise way of describing the grand ending of the grand scheme of God. But before we read that, I want to elaborate on it just a little bit by 
helping you recollect for you the beginning of the story. I'm asking you, what is the grand ending of this grand scheme? And I'm helping you to understand it and answer that question by telling you the beginning of the story. Now, we know that some 8,000 years ago, what happened there 8,000 years ago? Children, notice that our forefather Adam plunged the entire human race into death by way of yielding to the serpent's temptation to disobey God's one simple command, right? The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And from man's perspective, that is when God introduced his grand design to redeem mankind. Genesis 3.15 tells us that the seed of the woman would crush the dragon's head. The seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. And while the serpent then would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. When did that happen? When did that happen? At the cross. That happened roughly 2,000 years ago. The Bible says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman. Made of a woman. Made under the law. To redeem them that were under the law. That we might receive the adoption of sons. That's also already happened. Now, how did God remain redeemed man? How did God redeem man? Through Christ, of course. How did Christ redeem them who were dead in sins and trespasses? By being bruised by the heel, by the serpent, Christ died for the ungodly. The Bible says, but, com but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That part of the grand scheme of redemption of God also had already happened. And did the apostles understand that part of the grand scheme of redemption of God? No, they did not. They were they, they were devastated. They were beyond disappointed. Nonetheless, that was a part of the grand scheme which they never expected. What's next? What's the next part of the grand scheme of the redemption of God? Christ did not stay dead, praise the Lord. He arose from the grave. That's what God means when he said 8,000 years ago that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. That's what God means when he said that the seed of the woman would crush the dragon's head. The Apostle Paul quoted an Old Testament verse which says, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The enemies of Christ fell. Sin fell. Death fell. The dragon fell. And one by one, all the enemies of Christ will fall. But that's only half of the grand scheme of God. What's the other half? You're looking at it in Psalm 
110, verse 1. Let's look at that together. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that is the ending of this grand scheme of God to redeem mankind. The psalmist here, King David of Israel, he received an oracle when he said, The Lord said unto my Lord about the decree of God. In other words, the grand scheme of God. David, being a prophet, would, uh, uh, foresaw that one of his descendants would be his Lord. Uh, that David king, that David, that, that king David would, would, would rule over the people of God by divine authority. He pictured him seated at God's right hand as a co-ruler. And, and the, the picture that David is giving out here is that of, uh, of the ancient nations the royal practice of having the son of the king co-rule with his father, the king. And so, let me ask you a couple of questions. Number one, is Psalm 110 verse 1 happening right now? Is there anywhere somewhere in the New Testament about someone seated at the right hand of God the Father, co-ruling the universe with God the Father. Are there verses in the New Testament where it says that Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God? And what's the answer, church? The answer is yes. It is happening right now. Yes, there is someone seated at God's right hand right now, and his name is Jesus Christ. One of the uh, verses that I'm referring to is found in Hebrews, where the writer of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And get this, right now, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the prince who slayed the dragon, is being given by God the Father, his enemies, one by one, to become his footstool, meaning to be subjugated to him. Next question for you. What major event in Christ's life and resurrection that ushered Jesus to the right hand of God the Father? What event in the life of Jesus Christ that ushered him to go to the right hand of God the Father? The ascension the exaltation, his being ascended, taken up by the clouds of glory into heaven. That is a major event, is it not? And that's why ascension is essential. And we Baptist folks need to pay attention to this. We need to celebrate the ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you see, it's all part of that grand scheme of God. It's like a domino effect, isn't it? That's why I said earlier, let's come away with this great, amazing truth. And what was that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? That the ascension of Jesus Christ reminds us that everything that is happening right now within the scheme of God is happening according to 
plan. The teaching of Scripture seems to point to this great amazing truth. There is a grand purpose. There is an overarching plan. There is a grand scheme of things that this whole world is being ushered into, that this whole world is being directed towards, and that this whole universe is being steered to a grand, grand ending. Now, If you think of it in terms of reading a great novel, there's a beginning, a middle, and then an end. The beginning, pay attention. There is a serpent, a wicked dragon, which tempted Adam to sin. Adam succumbed into the dragon's temptation and therefore plunges the entire human race into sin and death. But the great creator, however, promised a second Adam who would also be tempted by the dragon. Was Jesus Christ tempted by the dragon? But not only not sin, but this second Adam would actually slay the dragon. Now, middle of the story, the second Adam came 8,000 years later. Can you imagine that? God promised it in uh, Genesis 3.15, and it took him 8,000 years to send the seed of the woman. Tempted by the dragon, never sinned, but his heel was bruised by the dragon. Moreover, a twist of all twists of the story, this second Adam rose from the dead and therefore drove a death blow to the dragon's head. The second Adam is what we know in history now as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is the one about whom the gospel writers wrote so much. He is the one whom the whole world either loves or hates. He is the one whom the whole world has to decide to either bow the knee in repentance and faith or to reject him altogether. He is the prince unto whom all authority and power in heaven and in earth are given. And therefore said he to his disciples what? All power is given unto me. All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And then what? What did he say after that, church? Go ye therefore. To do what? And make disciples, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Can't you hear the echoing truth? And lo, I am with you. Everything is going according to plan. Therefore, go and make disciples faithfully. Therefore, Go and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Everything about the grand story of God is happening according to plan. Therefore, be diligent about making disciples of all nations. Therefore, hold the rope for those who go down into the caves, so to speak. Therefore, Continue to support them with your earnest prayers and most gracious financial support as well. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Revelation 21. We will end with this. From the apostles' point of view, they were very slow to get it. By the way, to be fair to them, They didn't have the ending of the story quite like we do now in the book of Revelation, did they? That's why when Jesus ascended into 
the clouds, taken up by the clouds of glory, they gazed into until it was a speck in their eyes. They gazed into the heavens. They gazed into the clouds of glory which took Jesus up. And they were probably asking the question, Lord, why are you leaving now? I think that was the prevailing question that they had in mind. Lord, you died on the cross. You were buried. And we were disappointed, to say the least. We were devastated, beyond devastated. Our most expectations, our utmost expectations were crushed, Lord. But then you rose again from the grave. And that really blew our minds, Lord. And our hopes and our expectations were once again revived. And you've been with us, Lord, now for 40 days, and yet you're leaving us now? Why? The apostles did not get the grand scheme of things, at least not immediately. And so today... Sometimes we don't get, we don't understand the grand scheme of God. Isn't there a verse in the Bible that says that God's ways are so much higher than our ways? That his thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts? And so from time to time, we do not understand the grand scheme of God. He told the disciples to wait. We read in Acts 1, 1 through 11. It is hard for us to wait, isn't it? And we, from time to time, don't understand the grand scheme of God. When we're suffering life's circumstances, when we're in so much pain, when problems pile up on us, what do we do? We get disappointed. We get devastated. We lose sight of the grand scheme of things that one day, look at verses 4 and 5 of Revelation 21. Oh, this is beautiful. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, from your eyes. Amen, bless the Lord. God shall wipe away the tears from your eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Look, look. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Can't you hear the echoing truth? Everything is going according to plan. Amen to that. For these, I make all things new. And he said unto me, right. For these words are true and faithful. Oh, this is a blessing. This is wonderful. He's telling John, John, write this. Why? Because everything is going according to plan. The ascension of Jesus Christ assured Jesus himself to the throne of God, the Father, so he can be at the right hand of the Father and his enemies thrown down under his feet, one by one, beginning with the enemy that is sin, death, the wicked dragon, the evil governments of this world, one nation after another, the nations that reject Jesus, and individuals that reject the kingship and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Oh, this is wonderful. The ascension reminds us that everything is going 
according to the grand scheme of God. What a blessed hope. This afternoon, Lord willing, I'm going to teach on the necessity of the ascension of Jesus Christ. Why was it needful for Jesus to go back to the Father? I hope you'll come. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father and our God, thank you for our big brother, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the mighty builder of this church, the one who is right now seated at the right hand of God the Father, whom being given unto him, yea, thrown down, his enemies to be placed under his feet, conquer them, mightily crush them. They become his footstool. Let us not lose sight of this grand scheme of things. His ascension ushered our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to the right hand of the Father, and therefore showing us that everything is going according to plan. Help us to consider these things and use it to encourage us, especially in our times of devastation, frustration, disappointments, pain, and suffering. Help us, Lord, I pray, in Jesus' precious name. And God's people say, amen and amen.